Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, our webinar today about low quality post print becoming high quality post print. Uh, just to give you a few practical things before we get started, what you see is on the right hand side of the screen uh, a couple of different tabs. One is for questions. So during the webinar itself, if you have a question, you can ask that and we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. And then the other thing is you'll see another tab for polls. So what we want to do is actually ask you some questions uh, during the presentation. We'd love to get your feedback. The webinar is being recorded. So shortly after it ends, you'll get an email with a link to the recording. So you can go back and look at that. Uh, and if you have any issues with the audio or video during the webinar, you can just refresh your browser. Also, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a little help button. And you can click on there. And if you uh, click there on the bottom, you'll see a number you can also dial into for the audio if you would like to do that. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is exciting. Uh, we titled this Moving the Goalpost. And it's really looking at uh, some new capabilities on lower quality uh, corrugated board and, and what we can do with some new technologies. Before we go too far, uh, when we do all these webinars, we really focus it to be more interactive and problem solving and really presenting solutions to the industry. Uh, and we also base it on the ask the expert philosophy so that people can really get more troubleshooting help in what they're doing. And a lot of these webinars have come from demand from people following other webinars. And this is to a degree a follow-up from an earlier webinar we did this year around uh, ink foaming in with water-based inks. And you'll kind of see, we'll kind of go through the whole story of, of how this kind of progressed, really. To give you an idea about the FlexoKite itself, so we have a couple of fully equipped demo centers, one in the Netherlands and one in India, where we can really take everything from, from PDF to plate or PDF to print. Uh, give people more uh, education around analogs and print support, uh, show them the latest technologies that are available from, from plates, from screening, from uh, working together with ink suppliers, tapes, everything, uh, and give people a, a different place to, to get a kind of comprehensive demo or training when we look at the whole process from PDF to plate or print. We've got a couple of people joining us today. Uh, the first one is Phil Walmsley from uh, Waldo, Managing Director, who has a huge experience in, in the corrugated industry. We also have Robert Bruce joining us from ESCO. Uh, again, huge experience. He'll be talking about some of the, the new screenings that, that ESCO have been producing, we're using today. And then, of course, Nick Harvey, our Technical Director from Apex, uh, giving us some more insight into some of the technical challenges that you see and how to get around those within corrugated. The agenda today, we're going to cover first some trends that we see happening in the corrugated packaging. There's a lot changing uh, in the industry, certainly related to COVID has driven a lot of change. We'll look at the scope of the project itself. We'll take a look at some of the technologies that are kind of driving these quality improvements. And then we'll finish up with a roadmap of, of how we got to where we are today and how we, we reached all these results. <clears throat> So we're going to kick off with the trends, and I'm going to hand over to Phil to give us some insight about things that are starting to happen now within the corrugated packaging industry. Morning, everyone. Um, I think it's, uh, it's fair to say it's been a strange couple of years or so uh, in the industry. Um, and I guess over that period of time, trends have changed somewhat. Um, obviously, with people working from home, et cetera, um, and more, more, more things being ordered via e-commerce. Um, the uh, the demand for, for corrugated packaging um, and is, is being immense, and um, there's, there's been a more fo focus on a basic print, if you will, as opposed to the the quality end. Um, the HQPP a few years back, uh, as many of you will know, was. Many, many people were printing at 136, 142, whatever. Um, that in itself caused problems um, on press. Um, and I think just it was just because we could do it, it doesn't mean that we should actually print it. 
Um, that was then, but this is now. And um, my company, Waldo, uh, we have invested heavily with ESCO uh, on the XPS side of things. Uh, we have two XPS exposures and XPS crystal. And um, the reason for that is to get consistency in, in plate production and enable rep repeatability. Um, what this means from my point of view is that we can now look at the, at the HQPP uh, to produce more consistent and more repeatable work of a higher quality. Uh, and the quality of the plate uh, with the software from ESCO will enable the printer to print the jobs a lot easier than they did do previously. Um, we've also focused on moving to a thinner plate. Uh, we, we use predominantly McDermott material. Uh, we work really closely with them and we worked alongside them developing the edge plate, uh, which is the ITP edge plate, which is specifically for corrugated. And the results uh, of what we can actually see on the plate uh, using the ESCO software and Express process uh, are absolutely fantastic. Um, people are also looking to obviously save costs. Um, we're looking to push more and more to doing more fixed pallet work. We're at the present moment in time working with a client uh, who deal with a, a large confectionery business. And th at the moment they print their jobs seven colors. Uh, we're looking to reduce that down to five, obviously uh, massive savings on ink, etc., And also uh, helping them to reduce setup times as well, um, which again is cost saving. I mean, it's all about efficiencies as we know nowadays. Um, Believe it or not, guys, this pandemic will end, and I think that's what we need to focus on now. Um, we need to focus on what's going to happen the other the other side, and let's get ourselves prepared for what I believe will be, you know, some massive changes in the industry. And I think, obviously, with the the, the, the plastic uh, versus uh, board argument, um, there's going to be a massive uh, shift in business to to corrugate it. Um, um, and I think that we should be prepared and should look to be printing um, higher quality print, um, some of which we've, we've seen, obviously, we see that in flexible packaging. Um, and, yeah, I think we should really focus on that side of things. Um, having said that, you know, if we're going to still keep printing a one colour brown box with, with somebody's logo on, if it's two, three, four colour, whatever, we, it should be the best one, two, three, four colour job that we can possibly print. Um, and I think with the improvement in plate technology, uh, screening software, and also um, analogs, they say analogs, I know guys, um, we, um, you know, I think the future is looking good for the industry. Um, and I think, yeah, if, if if you don't buy a lottery ticket, you ain't going to win a prize. So let, let's, you know, let's let's dig deep and let, let, let's let's buy some tickets. Um, basically, that's all I've got to say because you know I'm really excited about the industry as it is at the present moment in time. There's there's lots there's lots of other technologies, uh, screen technologies that other people are, are, are investing in, and I think it's an exciting time to be in this industry. Um, so yeah, let's get out of this pandemic and and let's push this uh, market forward. Thanks, Phil. <clears throat> so now I want to move on to our first poll question. Uh, what we'd really like to understand is what's the largest percentage of, uh, when you look at the print you're doing today for corrugated, what's the, the usual rulings that you print? Is that uh, 65 lines per inch or 25 lines per centimeter? 85 lines per inch or 34 lines per centimeter? 140 or 133 and 54? So we'd just like to get an idea what you guys are producing today. So we'll give everyone a few minutes to go in and, and fill in those, uh, fill and answer the question. It's always interesting because when we start to do the poll questions, you kind of see also other people across the industry, what they're doing and what they primarily print. Uh, I think if we look at the results now, only a few people going above 85, which is not really surprising. Uh, most people around 85 or 65 LPI. 
that, that tends to be what we really see. And, and that's kind of what led us into a little bit in the project itself today. So now let's take a look a little bit deeper at the project scope and, and the things we were trying to analyze and, and look at for the project. And I'm gonna hand over to Nick. Okay, hi everybody. Um, right, we, we looked at this, the corrugated industry. Obviously there's a lot of growth, a lot of uh, interest and innovation in, in this field. And we asked a few questions uh, from the experts that, uh, that we have in the, in the team. And uh, we've seen previously a lot of uh, sample boxes, boxes that have been printed with F flute uh, coated board and uh, very you know high quality pushing the boundaries. But this is 10% of the printed corrugated box that's in the industry today. So we thought, let's look at this a little bit different and look at it with your B flute, your test liner and your everyday uh, product that is being produced across the globe. And we asked a few questions. So, you know, can we can we print 142 LPI uh, with illustrations? And the answer to that is yes, we can. The color would be very flat and uh, the lay down would be very poor. So we then looked at can we achieve close to ISO color density? And uh, again, yes, we can. Um, but you will be putting more ink down and more more color down, which would impair what you can do with your screen. And again, can we have a good uniform ink lay down? Again, of course we can with uh, a lot of ink at the at the substrate, at the at the board. But can we achieve? all the above at the same time. That is the challenge. So take a 65 line normal screen that we're printing. And uh, ha if we can't print 142 with that color density and achieve a good lay down, um, if not, why not? So basically push the boundaries and see what we could do with this project for the mass produced test liner and brand box board. So when we went, when we came to look at this, it's, there's, a, there's a number of ways of going, going to it, but um, we dissected the process to understand where is the best starting point, because in the end, there's a lot of complex characteristics of, of corrugated printing or printing in general. You've got the analogs, you've got the ink, you've got the tape, you've got the material, you've got the plate, the screening, all of these things. So you have to kind of look right back to the to the beginning and to see where to start from so from our side as you would expect um, the analux is a key factor in achieving what color density you can get um, but, and also a key link into ensuring how clean those dots will print on that note if the analux and the ink aren't in tune together and working together then the delivery of that ink to the printing plate will not be optimum and then whatever esco or uh, waldo do with the printing plate and the screening will be impaired because they're not getting the perfect delivery of ink uh, to the to the plate itself so let's look firstly at the negatives or how to turn them into positives if the analogs and the ink are not in tune together so we can understand some of the problems that occur if we don't have these things in balance. So viscosity of the water-based ink is, is, is a key factor, along with uh, other elements that you can see down the right. The viscosity can be down to how much foam's in there and um, how thick that, uh, that ink is, uh, the speed of the flow, the pH value, and the additives that you put into the ink in order to, uh, to reduce that foaming and uh, and get a nice late um, nice flowing ink also have an effect which we'll come on to shortly in in the uh, in the ink transfer the temperature and the metering system obviously corrugated you have rubber roll machines across uh, across the market you also have the doctor blade systems so another thing to look at is the pigment size of the ink this is another uh, consideration in corrugated depending on which ink supplier 
what um, what pigment is used, you can get significantly different particle sizes. If the particle size is too big, it's not going to get into the cell, or if it does get into the cell or the engraving, it's not going to come out. So it's going to give you a poor print. You've also got to look at the drying capacity. We can put as much ink or as much volume in an analogs that uh, that you want, but is that going to dry before the next color comes on top of it? Is it going to create a damp, wet board? So again, all of these characteristics need to be looked at and considered. And then foaming. This is, uh, we've done a webinar, as, as Dan said, which this is a spin-off from. Uh, you can see this, uh, we'll refer to it later in uh, at flexokite.com, where all of the webinars are. So there's a full, full, uh, full webinar dedicated to this with the ink supplier and pump supplier, etc. So I won't go too much into it. But um, basically, if you've got uh, foaming in the ink, it gets thicker, it gets more like a mousse, and it doesn't flow and it doesn't print particularly well. So the solution is to add, uh, manually add antifoam agents, and these will have a negative impact, which we'll come up to. So just from the ink alone, uh, before it even gets to the, uh, to, to the printing plate, uh, it has to be kept in balance. If we put these additions of antifoam in, which is common across the industry, that antifoam will give a negative effect on the printing and the wetting out performance. You also tend to use uh, a transfer additive again on top of that to, to try and eliminate the negative effect from the antifoam. And all these things are happening while you're trying to print and uh, get your uh, allocation of production out the door. So put it into simple terms, there's a nice analogy. Uh, if you drink a lot of coffee, you might get some headaches. So if you get some headaches, you might take some headache tablets. Those headache tablets, you might not sleep very well. Uh, you might become more tired. And you may become more anxious. And there's a different pill for all of these different uh, situations where the simple answer is don't drink the coffee. That's what we're trying to get across here. Don't put the antifoam agent in if you don't need to. Don't put the transfer additive in if you don't need to have that ink as uh, print um, friendly as it possibly can be. And if the process can uh, allow that to happen, you're already in a very stable, calm ink transfer um, situation. So these are comments from converters, all referring to too much antifoam. You can get mottling on the print, which is going to give you a, um, a, a less, less color shade. And if that's, <clears throat> that's the case, you need more volume to try and mask this. So more volume means uh, more ink, which means less, uh, uh, less quality of printed dots. Also, it, have, it has an effect on trapping. So when you're laying these inks over the top of one another, if, uh, if they're not um, drying and, 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 uh, and allowing the next ink to come on top, you're going to get a flat and, and, and the image is going to be uh, impaired because it's, uh, you're not getting a pure, pure dot or a pure color. So with this, uh, we looked at this and, and looked at a number of things and purely on the foaming and the performance of the ink, um, the GTT-M in corrugated, uh, this has been proven to reduce the need for manual additions and uh, allows you to achieve the correct color density values of a higher level. So this was the chosen analogs so that we are delivering and um, giving the best uh, application of ink to the printing plate. And just one little bit of uh, proof on this, that's the, that's the physical ink uh, you can see the bucket on the left uh, is far more calm with less bubbles than the, the one on the right hand side. And that's just through ink pumping through, um, uh, through the chambered system and back into the, back into the, uh, the bucket. So if we can remove the, uh, the need to add the antifoam, 
then again, you've got a far better balanced ink that's been transferred to the plate. All right, thanks, Nick. So now we're gonna move on to poll question number two. Again, you'll see this pop up on the right-hand side. So it's kind of like to give us some insight in what do you see as a trend happening in post-print industry? So more colors per design, higher resolution images, printing inside the box as well as outside, shorter run lengths, digital printing, or even other. So you can come in and, and just tell us what you really see happening within your production and your print. <clears throat> I really appreciate everyone giving us your insights and, and what you see. I think it's helpful for everyone too to kind of see what's happening. And I think looking at the results here, it's it's combination of a lot of different things. More high resolution images, more colors per design. Of course, short run lengths, we see that happening, printing the inside and outside, growth of digital coming. Yep. Great. So now I'm going to hand over to uh, Mr. Bruce to give us some insight into technologies that are kind of helping drive these quality improvements. Thank you very much, Dan, and uh, good morning, everyone. So when we look at this, we're going to go into this a little bit more detail, but we really look at kind of the possibility of moving the goalpost. And it's really when you look at what we typically see as the quality achievements or possibilities on, you know, a B-flute, uncoated test liner, I think when we see that, that really starts to change now. Thanks, Dan. So I'm just going to be um, focusing on uh, three areas as part of this uh, whole story of uh, moving into this uh, high quality post print arena. So first of all, if we're looking to move jobs from uh, a pre print environment, whether that's Flexo or, or Litho, uh, what's the implication for those images? Uh, looking at, at plates and, and how screening is uh, having a, an impact with those plates. And then just a, a few insights from, um, from, from ESCO when we developed a new screen, uh, just a couple of results as to how they performed on press and uh, then how we took those forward into this particular project. So yeah, first of all, images. So the, the, the first thing to say is um, a common issue with uh, corrugated plates is uh, controlling that relief depth and keeping that minimum dot stable on, on the plate. And what we want to av avoid, if at all possible, is uh, the, the cause and effect of that on the right-hand side, which is you spend quite a lot of time on, on the, the printing press, uh, doing tests and trials. And uh, then if you have some inconsistencies in that process, you then uh, left trying to, to chase the print quality and uh, and avoiding these these hard edges when you're trying to transfer those jobs from uh, offset into uh, into flexo so how would we do that from a, a, an image perspective so uh, if we do have those particular issues that we saw on the previous slide then uh, when we take that uh, offset image that you see on the left hand side and try and print it flexo then we have all of these uh, typical uh, hard edge issues that uh, all the guys from flexible packaging and, uh, and narrow web have, have now overcome over the years and now we're looking to address this uh, on on the esco side as well so typically what would happen today would be that a, uh, a skilled operator would retouch that image uh, probably put a minimum dot all the way through. And uh, once you've done that on the left-hand side and then come to print it with conventional tools as the, as we see them today, then you would typically have a compromise in, in that uh, print quality in terms of uh, losing that, that color saturation and that image fidelity. So we're basically left with the situation in standard Flexo today where 
uh, maybe a job's been previously printed, pre-print, and we're looking to convert that over to Flexo, and, and we're really compromised in terms of uh, what we can do. So what technology can we look to do uh, use today to try and uh, enable that smoother shift from uh, a preprint to a, a post-print application? So for that, we're going to look to focus on uh, on the plates and some of the things that we look to do on, on our side and what's been used in this particular project to, uh, to enable that move. And the, the first thing to touch on is that that plate stability. So we don't want this minimum dot to be to, to be moving on press. Uh, we don't want the printer to be chasing the plate and making compromises on press to try and get good print quality. And one of the first things that we look to do uh, to, to overcome that is by addressing the standard tolerances that we see in plate making today, in flexo plate making. And we look to do that by uh, reducing those tolerances within the uh, the relief layer. If we can do that and make the foundation of the plate as flat as possible, then that gives us the maximum opportunity to uh, reproduce a good, stable, robust dot that's going to print on press uh, time and time again. And and for us, uh, for, for this particular project, uh, for, for that we use the, uh, the, the Crystal XPS. So exposing the plate and getting the, the plate to be as consistent as uh, as possible is is one part of the story. Uh, the, the next part is is how do we profile the uh, the, the plate correctly for the uh, for the corrugated process? And for that we have a, a piece of software uh, called Print Control Wizard, and uh, we have this standard test chart that we use for for high quality post print. And, and it's broken down into um, different areas where we can basically print this, read the data in uh, using a, an I1 IO. And we then have two choices. We can either let the software make some decisions for us automatically to guide us through the process. Or if you're a, a, an expert in the subject, you have full control to uh, be able to select whatever parameters you feel are best. But here are some of those parameters. So Nick previously uh, touched on uh, on, on ink transfer uh, and how foaming and the analogs plays a part in that. Uh, and, and we see also the plate can, can play a, a, a part in this process too, and, and aid the ability to trap and uh, aid the ability to, uh, to reduce that model if, as Nick said, the, the ink is delivered in a, in a good way. So we have uh, multiple different surface screens that we can uh, look to use to, to optimize or to help optimize, play a part in this optimization of the uh, of the mottling and the trapping the second part of the story is uh, dot shape so we see that different uh, dot shapes can uh, have an effect in terms of how smooth the, uh, the the vignettes can can look so if you're printing single color vignettes or you're you're printing those 142 LP, uh, lpi images trying to print with a full tone range to enable that move from offset to, to flexo is, is paramount. So again, working with different dot shapes enables us to um, give you options to, uh, to, to get the best possible quality. The, the next part is the minimum dot selection. Uh, and, and this is one of the most crucial parts um, from our side of the fence uh, in terms of uh, generating that good for print plate. And there's many, many different parameters which go into uh, defining what, what minimum dot you can actually use from plate type, plate thickness, relief depth, board type, press speed, and then all the impression settings that go onto the press will determine what, what minimum dot you can actually reproduce, not just on that one particular fingerprint, but time and time again in, in production. So here we have some uh, some new innovation. Uh, we call it Crystal V, uh, where we feel that we've uh, got a, a nice robust um, selection of dots, which can uh, work really well in this uh, high quality post print arena. And we'll touch on this subject a little bit further uh, in, in the slides to come. Next thing is controlling the dot gain. So uh, yeah, we want all our colors to be in balance. Um, 
we want to have the maximum uh, uh, tone values uh, and, and be able to, to print those uh, high quality images which have been uh, produced previously in offset and and control and dot gain is a massive part of uh, profiling the plate correctly to enable us to do that and the last part is uh, really centered on simplification so we've seen that during our, our pre-release phase of testing and trialing these screens there's a, a subset which work in in some in most general um, conditions and we have uh, a series of four pre-configured screens that can be used uh, straight out of the box um, uh, to, to aid and uh, simplify the, the, the process further. So we understand the, the, the problem that we have with, with images, and we, we know that we don't want to, to utilize um, standard retouching techniques. Uh, we've now gone through the process of making some nice stable plates and, and also calibrating them properly. So if we go through all these processes, how can these plates look on, on press? This is a little bit of a, a busy slide, but it, it gives a, a, a sense in terms of uh, some of the capabilities that we have now. So on the left-hand side, we have our, our minimum uh, printed dot chart that you read in automatically with the with the i1 io and it selects them in dot for us then on this particular occasion we uh for, for this trial that we did during pre-release we had just these standard um, um press configurations so there's nothing special here but then on the chart on the on the right hand side what we see uh in the red was the unstable dots that that were could potentially be used and what you see is a very few amount of those uh, dots were unprintable. What we see then in the dark blue is a, a lot of these minimum dots that, that could be selected, printed really, really well. They gave low tone values and, and printed very robustly. So this moves now the, the, the argument away from the first slide that we saw with the, uh, with the minimum dot moving around, not being very robust. Now with this configuration, we see that we have lots of choices and lots of ability to uh, to reproduce this this high quality work, and and this blue section really shows now that the process can be very very robust for the printer. And what this has allowed us to do is is have this evolution, I would say, in in screening. So. On the left-hand side, you can see the, the, the standard dot that's used in the industry. It would be a round fogger dot, or maybe you're using a circular dot. And the, the issue with that, you can see on that radial vignette, it is that you have this, this hard edge. There's no way to control that. In the center, we released quite some time ago now, uh, our HD Flexo solution. But these screen sets were always limited because we were working with bank exposure frames. And with bank exposure frames, we don't have that ability to bring the level of control and consistency in plate making. So we see that now more as an intermediate solution. To move on to the right hand side where we've been able to combine these new crystal screens with the XPS and, and really look to, to drive not only the quality, but also the stability and consistency that you can now get on press. So now this does potentially allow us to play our part in, in, in this story in terms of uh, driving this, uh, this shift from offset to flexo and then uh, not have a compromise in, in your image today. But of course, we're, we're only playing a part of in, in this parts and uh, sorry, plates and screening is, is one element. And um, I'm sure that with the slides to come, you'll see how all these elements come together to, uh, to, to print some really good stuff. So Dan, thank you very much. Back over to you. Thanks, Rob. So that's going to take us on to the poll question number three. Again, you'll see this pop up on the right-hand side. So what would be the benefits for you if you could print an offset or preprint quality on a uncoated test liner, like on B-flute? Could it be faster production speeds, reduced waste of board, uh, less ink cost, faster delivery time? or the ability to win orders from different markets.
So we'll see what pops up here <clears throat> as results. A lot of people, uh, I think when we look right now, looking at reduced waste of the board, ability to win orders from different markets, faster delivery times, faster production speeds. Yeah, that's interesting to see. I'll just wait a couple more minutes, give everyone a chance to answer. Yeah, I think uh, when you look at the 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 one that, that sticks out the most here, the ability to win orders from different markets is uh, is exactly what we thought when we went through this process. So I'll kind of take you through uh, a little bit more of the project roadmap. So, you know, we started this process earlier in the year and actually we really wanted to just make some more print samples for ourselves. And we said, you know, we'll use the latest technologies available uh, from, from screens, from plates and everything else. And, and let's just really see how nice a sample we can make, you know? And as we went through that, we, we really got surprised. Uh, and it really led us down a path we didn't anticipate going to. So the, the plates we started out using were McDermott, Edge, and Mellow. Uh, we were using some new corrugated screens. An important thing about the screens is they're also made to be imaged at a lower resolution, so that that means anyone who's producing the new screens doesn't need to slow down their production for the plates. We use some new engravings that Nick was talking about that we can reduce uh, the, the foaming and the air that we get in there. Uh, we really wanted to take a, a basic, uh, you know, B flute test liner, uh, uncoated. And we printed most of these on a Gockford press. But the very first was kind of looking at how can we improve the lay down of the ink on the material. And what you see here in the bottom left are the A is a standard solid and the other letters are different types of screens. And so what we saw is when we're printing with a, a lower volume analogs, we don't really see any kind of benefit coming out of the surface patterns. But if we change the volume of ink, now we start to see a completely different picture. You can see a comparison between each one of these also in here. We actually were printing and I was surprised the density of the magenta here was two, which was really surprising to me. And when you look at the two together, what we start to see is something, something slightly different. And that's that uh, it's a correlation we saw also in something we did with white. And when you look at surface screens, it's, it's a little bit, you know, difficult to try and evaluate where's the problem or, or what gives us the benefit. And what we really see is that you can hold the screens now on any one of the new generation plates. And the problem is not the plate, the problem is not the screen, but there is a correlation between that surface pattern and the amount of ink it gets. So if you have a surface pattern that's not getting enough ink, then what you see is on the left, you know, what starts to happen. It looks like it's not really completely printing when we increase that level of ink, you start to see what happens with the actual pattern and how that can really improve the lay down. You see, you know, some cases there's still a little bit of washboarding, other ones that's really going away. The next thing we did is we said, let's really push the boundary. So we can probably print at 85 LPI, that should be possible. Uh, but let's also look at 110, 126, and 142. And when we did this, we really, we weren't really sure what we were gonna get. And when we got these results, we just kind of said, we need to take a step back now and, and look at this because this really highlighted some new capabilities that we really weren't anticipating. So the next step that we did is we did a technical test at the different rulings. We have the exact same elements printing at all these different rulings and trying to see how do they work? Where's the edge? You know, how far can we push things? And so we've got, you know, different types of images uh, that are challenging. 
uh, some basic gradients in there, some flat tints, uh, text areas to look at the ink trapping. And so we wanted to try and see, and so we were really surprised to see how good 142 was. And so we just then took this to the next level to say, right, let's now produce some results and we can compare an 85, which is kind of typical for what people would, would possibly print on an uncoated test liner and see how that goes. And so we did some four color prints again to do some comparisons and see how everything prints out. Uh, it was really amazing to see the different uh, quality and, and the cleanness of the print. Uh, one of the things you see is if you can print at a higher screen ruling, you get a slightly cleaner color. So you get a little bit more saturation. You can kind of see that in some of these up here. But it was really surprising. The other thing we said is, right, what happens if we just take this same technology, the things we have available, and let's print it on, uh, you know, let's, let's look at how far can we go. So we started to look at, you know, can we really print to zero in corrugated? When you look at it visually, yes. And when you start to really zoom in and look at some of the prints, so I took some of these with a little microscope, uh, you know, you can really see how clean all these dots are printing. And it was really, really surprising uh, to get this kind of, quality and, and end results on a test liner. We also, you know, when you look at some of the images, the amount of detail you get in there. And again, on the test liner, I was really shocked. So when you zoom in and you have here, it's it's a, a four color image. And, and in some areas, we're printing the, the gray out of only cyan, magenta, yellow and black and other places only black only. But when you start to look at zoom in on some of these, I was just really astounded by how clean, how smooth everything was printing on this type of board. You know, this is really what you would expect uh, from offset or, or flexible packaging, you know. And again, here you see how fine everything is still printing and crisp and everything else. It was really, really surprising for us to really see these results. Then we also said, right, can we kind of push the envelope? Let's do a test on just an uncoated brown test liner, right? Let's take some images. Would it would it look nice? This is the type of, you know, box that you would see this side up or the recycle symbols or, you know, it's fragile or something else. But when we did this, I was really astounded by what we ended up with. And one of the areas that we put on here were just some simple illustrations to say, you know, how how good would those actually print? And when you look at the center again, we see the same thing on a brown test liner, right? So to kind of give you an idea, I actually have some of the prints here. And some of them, you know, we took some of the key lines and we were reducing them down. And they're really, really, really small. If you guys want to see some of these, let us know. But, you know, we have key lines printing at, at 0 0.12 millimeters probably finer than anyone would really print within corrugated, understandable. But again, our goal here was to see how far can we go. And when you start to look at these images, you know, it is really, really surprising how much detail stays in the image. Again, here for the motorcycle, you know, it's not the type of image anyone would normally think about printing on an uncoated brown test liner. But what you see is there's some real new capabilities starting to show up here, right? Uh, and before we go any farther, I just want to show a couple other images. This is another one that we printed for the actual box. And when you see like the tiger, again, you know, we, we started out and, and we just thought, wow, this is really, really amazing. The level of detail and color that you can start to see within the print. And so the other images too, I mean, you know, typical markets that you have, you guys are producing for, and we just really said, this is really something special. And that's why we wanted to come and share all this stuff with you guys and kind of see, you know, what's really happening. Again, the, the cleanliness of the print, the level of detail that you see, you can see here the difference between the 85 and the 142, you know, it's not so great color wise on the screen. 
But, you know, the water, everything you see there, the capabilities now with everything put together, I think can really lead uh, to new possibilities within the industry. So what I'd like to do now is go into some, some Q&A time and let's hear some of the questions that you guys have about how we produced some of this stuff or is there anything else you wanted to, uh, you want to hear? Okay. Frederick, I need some help. I'm not able to see the questions. Uh, okay. Great. Okay. So one of the questions we have is about the inks, analog plates, screenings, and what about tape? What are the recommendations? Uh, Phil, is there anything here you want to try and chip in? What would you What would you say with your experience? I mean, you have you guys are making plates for a lot of different types of printing companies. Uh, what are they doing now for for the things like tapes and and plates and everything? Uh, well, we're we're just using um, the same tape that we for for every type of work, whether it be HQPP or the bog standard, as you say, this way up um, and um it's it, no it, it's quite noticeable that there's no drop in in, in quality uh, or etc with it, the hqpp um we are working with a company uh, we worked alongside a company to to develop their tape further um it's an airflow tape um, um we've tried other tapes but you know uh, at the end of the day um we've got a tape that's sort of one size fits all really um um, and it can cope with the the new the new screening technologies and uh, and uh, just impair any reproduction. So um, yeah, it's yeah we just use the one type of plate. Sorry, one type of tape. We had another question about the plate itself. What we've been using for all these tests was the McDermott Edge with a two point eight four millimeter. Uh, we had another question about the run lengths. The most of the tests that we did initially, uh, the run lengths were around a thousand sheets. Uh, but what we've just done for the samples that we've been producing were uh, we did three thousand sheets. So it's a little bit longer print run than somebody would normally have. Just wait and see. We have some other questions coming in. Somebody to ask about a uh, possibility to uh, get some samples. Absolutely, we can. Uh, I think we can arrange that. That should be no problem. The speed that we ran the test was another question somebody asked. It was their their standard production speed of around a thousand sheets an hour, what we were producing. So uh, and their standard viscosities. So we actually, when we did the print, uh, went to try and and match offsets. Uh, densities for the print that one as well Dan I think Dan I think it's fair fair to say that you know we were not present at the printer uh, for this so this has been done uh, remotely due to a little bit due to COVID a little bit due to the the printer being in Poland but um, this isn't a project that has uh, had everybody crawling all over the print to, to get an, um, an absolute perfect single sample this has been put through normal production cycle and uh, normal production speeds and uh, makes it more relevant yeah. yeah we had another question here about what was the waste at running 140 versus 85 and uh really there's no difference because we didn't print anything separately uh on on this box uh when we did this print everything was at 142 uh, but on all the other prints, we had a combination of rulings. And again, we didn't want to we didn't want to cherry pick. We didn't want to take anything out. We said, let's just do a standard prints. And that's what we asked him to do your standard speeds, 
your your impression settings and and let's just see how far we can go and so even with all of these uh the other samples that we did they're all at multiple rulings so we didn't have a separate ruling a separate print for the 142 or for the 85 or anything Uh, this is a question definitely for you, Nick. Are there differences between analogs dedicated for corrugated versus flexible packaging and, and how that would affect the antifoam? Was there something else doing with the, with the engraving? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's first poignant to say that, look, you know, the, the engraving, the GTT is, um, is still branded and, and named the same as it's been for many years. It has actually evolved uh, a lot over that time. And uh, we've taken a lot of focus into uh, the corrugated industry, especially. And the reasons for that is to get the uh, the ink flow correct, and to not only deliver um, the right amount of ink, to focus on not getting the foaming, and also the cleanability of that analogs is um, are, are key aspects. You know, if we can deliver anything, whether it's a plate, an ink, a tape. Um, if it's only useful for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, it makes no uh, sense. It's not practical. Um, so we have to have an analogs that is, um, remains clean, is easier to clean, and uh, performs very well on press. So the GTT for corrugated is um, designed specifically for that market and specifically for water-based inks. So yes, and that has evolved over the over the last years. Okay. Uh, I had another question pop up here. Rob, this is going to be for you. Are there some differences with the the Crystal V screens versus the other screens that uh, Esco has been producing? Uh, yeah, there, there is. Thanks for the question. Yeah, the, the, the V stands for variable. So we're using variable dot sizes to transition into the highlights. And uh, this does two things, really. It, it reduces the um, the stochastic look to, to the dot, so to, to the eye. It, it looks a, a lot smoother and uh, allows us to use uh, a more uh, robust uh, dot in the highlights and the extreme highlights as well. Uh, so, so yeah, that's the difference between the, uh, the the standard technology that that we have for for flexible packaging, and I think also to mention the the resolution that these screens run at. I think Dan, you, you picked up on it as well. Uh, that all of our corrugated screens are, are imaged at twenty five forty DPI, and uh, there's no pixel plus on the um, on the CDI. So this allows you to run at, at maximum speed. So we're, we're well aware that uh, there's been a, a lack of innovation, I would say, in, in, in the corrugated sector for specifically on, on screens and that the margin for plates has been um, eroded over the past few years. So being able to uh, produce your plates at maximum speed was one of the core criteria when we looked to develop this Crystal V technology. Thanks, Rob. And uh, Phil, I had another question for you. Uh, do you see people moving to a thinner plates now for the corrugated prints versus the really thick plates that you would see traditionally for the boxes this side up everything else yeah i think there's definitely a trend towards that then um one it's the improvement in, in, in overall print quality um we've not made the 250 thou plate um well I, we stopped producing that four or five years ago um we do produce some 185, but the majority of the plates that we manufacture are 155, and, um, but maybe more 125. Obviously, we make up that difference in, in the reduced height with with foams on, 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 on the shims, etc. Um, and that's another thing, you know, the, the development in the uh, in in the in the backing foams. Um, uh, as I say, everything's moved on uh, so much over, over the years, um, you know, not just plates, software, the screen technology, um, the the tapes, 
everything ink and, and again it, it's 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 finding that sweet spot um to give you there is to give you the result you know one one set might not might work great on, on one press uh one client and you, you you try and replicate that another and it's just not quite right so um you know it's not a one size fits all but um we'll certainly get moving it towards that goal um but we we we've even challenged McDermott to say well look you know can we look at a, a plate thickness of a hundred that um again um if it, again like i keep saying if you don't try it you're never going to know um and again the thinner the plate uh, the more stable uh, and that, that that bottom end's going to be with the smaller dots and i think you know you're going to get even better better results but um I'm sure there's people out there listening and saying, you know, well, there's no way you're going to print a, a hundred thousand plate, but okay, well, let's let's try it, you know, and let's see where we go. But there's a definite trend towards thinner plates, um, and also it's from a handling point of view, from from the guys operating the press and transporting the plates about, you know, the the, the, the shins are lighter um, and they're easier to to actually mount on the press. Yeah, another question for you, Phil, was about the hardness of the edge plate. Do you know what the shore value is for that? Yeah, it's 38 shore. Right? That's at 112. But we, um, we've we also we've, we've sort of told that, um, that this the edge plate, yeah, it, it's predominantly for the HQPP, but yeah, and, and I guess you guys also noticed, you know, the, the, the lay down of the solids, uh, um, it, uh, in theory, they're saying that softly the plate, you should get a better lay down for solid areas. Um, but I think, as you guys have mentioned, you know, we're talking about um, densities of magenta two um, with this edge plate. Um, it's it's you know it, it's 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 doing both jobs the way we see it. So, um, which which was a surprise to us, um, and I guess surprise to maybe McDermott, but. Um, we we found with the mellow um, ourselves um, again. It's you, you get a great lay down, but it, you know if we're looking to push the boundaries uh, at these higher screen resolutions, um, it, it doesn't function as well down the bottom end uh, as the edge. Okay, uh, Nick had maybe this is a question you can answer. I'll, I'll throw it to you. It's uh, you know when we did those prints with the mellow, we had a really high density of two. And somebody's asking, you know, you can see a color shift in the in the in the ink. Uh, how can they compensate for that? I think it's pretty simple, just to use a slightly lower volume analogs, because at that point you're really getting, I wouldn't say too much ink, but more ink that you need. Yeah, I think that absolutely right. I, th I think your comment when you stated that we got the density to this was right back in the what can we achieve stage of this project you know this was the start off with a gtt l i believe um that was throwing a lot of ink uh, a lot of ink down and to find that sweet spot of of where the correct densities are you know your 1.45 or 1.5 for, for magenta is is optimum and if you can achieve that with the gtt m then um then this is what we did so uh that m allowed us to print the the 142 uh dots clean and pretty um i think it's fair to say we've looked at this in in a number of different ways and and to just make a nice pretty box and a pretty print um was not the goal the goal was how can we have something that is stable for production runs and uh, that's how this has been looked at from the plate, from the analogs, from the ink and the, and, and the repro and the retouching. So what you see in that box and all the, all the inserts that will be in there with all the technical information are prints that are production environment ready and, and not just tests. So um, I think that's, that's clear to say. And then I have uh, kind of more of a kind of combination of a question and a comment, but I think I'll throw this out to, to both Phil and to Robert. And that's that, uh, you know, there's still a lot that uh, pre-press can bring to to this arena in, in helping 
drive this change because uh, what you would normally do for you know low quality test liner, uh, you can kind of think of it in in a different way now and, and how you would approach producing those jobs. Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, we've certainly taken that view. Um, say we the way that I've sort of driven my business is you know we want to be the first to to achieve certain things in the marketplace we were the first uh, trade shop in the uk to get hd certification many years ago we were the first to get certification for the crystal uh, for crystal screen and crystal plate production in the uk and and let's say we never want to sit back and think well well we've, we've got something now we don't need to do any more let's just sit with it you know let's keep pushing it all the time and and as i said in my in my in my little piece when we started um we want to make the best we want our, our customers to produce the best one color job of the highest quality they possibly can and with the new technologies or the screening technologies plate technologies we can we can allow them to do that now um now they may have to also look at their analogs uh, specifications as well but um you know it, it opens new possibilities for them and again with you know with yeah we've, we've all ordered loads and loads of stuff from amazon and we get the brown box with the amazon logo on it but you know there's there's lots of other e-commerce stuff that that's flying about where you you know you can get some really intricate design uh and, and, and uh, printed and really effective if it, it, it's one color black on a brown box but you know it's it, there's a general potential to uplift overall quality in, in this industry, whether it be, as I say, a one color brown box or a five, six, seven color HQP paper. And I think just to pitch in from my side, Dan, I, I think we took a look at this project and we start from the press. So if we can optimize and calibrate that plate correctly um, and then move backwards, so using the, the the you know the latest screening the the, the latest uh, imaging technology to to, to maximise that plate quality, once you have that that sort of quality on press and working back, then then it allows you know companies like like Phil's end to to do some clever stuff in terms of reseparating jobs. So I know Phil, you mentioned beforehand, you know you're, you're looking at options to reduce a number of colours and fix palette and things like that. That's only really possible if you can optimize and get that high quality on, on your press. And I think that's the beauty of, of, of this forum, really, FlexiKite, in terms that, uh, yeah, we can do so much with the plate, but it also brings everybody else to the table to, to look to see how we can drive uh, this industry forward. Are you on mute, Dan? You're on mute, Dan. Okay, I got one more question. I think this is going to be for new you nick uh it's about using recycled ink but i'm not really sure is that is that using you know ink that, that's that's been in the press and comes back or is that really recycled ink i'm not that's new to me but yeah uh, it's, it's possible to be a recycled board is uh is obviously a, a, a large part of um uh, of, of how the industry is moving and and the ink as we said the, the ink pigmentation size of the particles is um is key and the additives that you put in there i think what we've looked at is you know it's a standard uh, test liner board um we haven't cherry picked the best uh, the brand box is the same and um you know we've we've gone with the industry standard and it's part of um you know flexo isn't isn't a um you know press a button and, and run forward what we've got is all the data all the um process parameters that we've been able to produce this box on and if those parameters change with recycled board or they change with a um a large size pigmented ink then collectively we'll look at that and uh and we can advise accordingly but you know what? What we've done so far is um, is the industry standard board ink. Uh, all is documented. All can be 
um, delivered out in a, in a white paper document to anybody that's interested. All right, thanks. I think we've uh, we've gone slightly over time. Uh, what you see now on screen are some contacts. So if you want to reach out to anyone you saw today, uh, feel free to do that. We, uh, as I said, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up now. Uh, shortly after after we finish, you'll get an email uh, with uh, a link to the recording, so you can go back and have a look at that. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. And then we'll all down all the all the questions that have been asked will uh, will all be formatted into a um, into a PDF, and the answers to those questions will be um, completed and, and again forwarded to everyone that attended. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks.